So good to, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, first of all, uh, thanks to um, all of you who are joining, joining this session. And I know it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult time. We had fantastic one and a half, half days. And um, so, and there are lots of other great sessions around. So, so therefore, you chose that one. And um, so this puts a lot of pressure also on, on the speakers here. So, so here, so uh, keep, keep, it, keep it going. So my name is Holger Dalkmann. I uh, work for the World Resources Institute. I'm heading there uh, the Embark program, which is the sustainable transport uh, program, working in uh, six countries with uh, 160 people, really helping us so, to enable sustainable transport on the ground, and I'm very excited to be here. Um, congratulations to C40, to a great, great event. Uh, but also thanks for a good partnership with C40, and over there is also uh, Gunjan. She's heading also the uh, transport working groups within C40, and we are uh, a good and proud partner. As you know, urbanization is the 21st century challenge, and um, transportation is in fact the key. It's really core, cool, so how we can also um, create our cities to, to quality of life, to livable spaces. And when we saw this so the last day, so, so getting even also to dinner, we immediately stuck us in con con congestion, and uh, which also affects many people around the world. And it comes also with a price when we see the motorization of, of one, one billion more cars might be added also to, to the planet until 2030. And we see currently the numbers on the impacts and the negative impacts are enormous. We think about it, so 1.2 million people every, every year die in road accidents. Half of that already in cities, and that will grow. And here our research shows also, if you actually move people also to safe walking, cycling, and public transport, then also this is saving, saving lives. We heard a lot about also the issues also of, of air quality, and every day you get more and more bad news, particularly also between Delhi and in Beijing, you don't know where you have the worst uh, quality. And I can go on and on about also the negatives. But let's talk about the good stuff. There are good, two good things. One is, we know the solutions. The solutions are there. And second, we have actions in cities. And here is the great reporter from C40, shows us in the C40 uh, areas. There are 230 actions registered, recorded, saying we, we cities also take, take action. And we had yesterday a fantastic session particularly looking more into the, the supply on the great solutions Buenos Aires came up with, with also Curitiba, thinking about BRT and, and land use and the, the, the integration. And this part is very important also to really keep people also on, on the sustainable transport side. But then, and this is also the session today about, then it becomes even more tricky. I can, we can't actually afford also all all cars in, in, in cities just so floating, floating around. And we need also certain restriction. We need also a system which, which finally works. And that brings us also to the session today on transport demand management. And this requires good technical solutions, but also requires quite a lot of courage and leadership also from, from the cities to really also say, well, we, we're not just doing also the popular things, but we're bringing really also the transport system in, in a shape that this really serves all our citizens and really also bring to, to quality of life and access for, for, for all. So I'm very pleased also that we have four of these champions uh, today, today here and um, to hear more about also their, their, their action. And um, before introducing also the, the speakers, um, we'll also introduce the session. So we will, in fact, uh, have, everybody will have 10 minutes, and I'm German by origin, so I told them also I will be quite, quite tough on, on, on them, so that we have enough time also 
on the, the panel to further also discuss, to really also to, to interact, what are the lessons learned? So the true uh, meaning really of a C40 summit and also get some, some of, of, of your, your questions. So with, with that, also again, also welcome. And um, um, by starting also now with, um, with San Francisco, and we have uh, Roger Kim here, he's the senior advisor of the city of San Francisco. So he started uh, half a year ago, he told me, but I, 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 I'm sure he will know everything about us as a system, so uh, warm applause also for Roger. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, one program within our larger transportation demand uh, management strategy, uh, focusing specifically on demand-based pricing uh, for parking. There we go there. Uh, so parking can be a, a challenging issue for uh, many cities, and, and it certainly affects quality of life. Uh, it can sometimes be uh, politically sensitive. Uh, but in San Francisco, we've emphasized parking uh, because how cities manage parking really touches on a lot of important and emer uh, urgent issues, uh, such as transportation and mobility, pedestrian safety, uh, certainly uh, emissions of greenhouse gases and pollutants, uh, and economic vitality, uh, particularly within our commercial corridors. So this presentation is an overview of, of SF Park, which is the name for a, a new approach to managing parking that we've been testing in San Francisco. So what is parking like in San Francisco? Um, well, to explain SF Park, let me just start with a picture, uh, something we see in every city, and, and a, a picture of exactly what we're trying to avoid. Uh, if you look closely, you'll see that every space is full, uh, so people double park their cars, or they're circling the block looking for parking. Um, you know, this wastes time, certainly wastes fuel. Uh, it's also dangerous. Drivers circling are distracted drivers making lots of left and right turns. Uh, and, and public transit is often stuck uh, in the middle, which is part of the reason why it uh, isn't as fast or, or as reliable as it should be. So how did we get here? You know, like every other city, uh, for a long time we've been using short time limits uh, to achieve turnover and flat rates and meters that charge the same price all day, every day. Uh, and this approach made sense in the past, uh, but as we saw, it doesn't really deliver the outcomes uh, that we're looking for. So, you know, we're in this pilot project, we're using data to manage towards the goal of one open space on every block. So again, the goal is to have one open space on every block so that you can most of the time quickly find a, a space. So this reduces circling and double parking, thereby uh, reducing congestion and greenhouse gas emissions uh, while improving safety and, and transit uh, and economic vitality. And what we're doing is we're seeing parking as a, as a tool to achieve our goals. And the idea is to make pricing of parking a transparent and rule-based uh, and data-driven process as opposed to uh, just setting one parking price and, and, and having that exist uh, over many years. So we have um, eight pilot areas, uh, which are highlighted on this map, uh, with new policies, uh, technology, and significant data collection. Uh, we have three control areas with no new policies, uh, no technology, uh, but also had significant data collection. Uh, we did 7,000 metered spaces, which is about 25% of the total uh, parking spaces in the city, and about over 12,000 off-street spaces or about 75% of the off-street spaces controlled by our transportation authority. Uh, so there are several key uh, pieces of infrastructure to the pilot program. Uh, you know, first is the new parking meters uh, that take credit cards and cell phones to make it easy, or make it really easy to pay. Uh, and all the meters now have time limits of no less than four hours. Uh, and that's part of the focus is really making uh, the experience of parking simple and easy uh, rather than frustrating and time-consuming. Uh, parking sensors. Uh, at the heart of the, the project are parking sensors that tell us in real time, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, whether or not a space has a car in it. Um, and it's a new technology, and this is the first real sizable uh, installation of these sensors anywhere in the world. Um, and 
you know, this allowed, uh, you know, sharing uh, parking sensor data means that drivers can get matched up with a parking space and off the road as quickly as possible. Uh, so we also made an iPhone app, uh, but more importantly, we share the data in an open uh, free data feed so that others can use that data uh, uh, out there. And, and that's what exactly happened. Uh, you're some of the other apps that were created using the data feed that the CD provided from, uh, from our sensors. But the kind of the, the secret sauce uh, of this is the demand responsive pricing. Uh, this is how we make uh, more parking spaces uh, available. Um, again, the goal is to have at least one available space per block. And what this means is that about every four to six weeks, uh, we adjust the rates up or down by, uh, by 25 cents uh, to gradually find the lowest rate possible where there's at least that one parking space available on the block. Uh, now, rates can vary by time of day, by block, uh, by day of the week, uh, whether it's the weekend or uh, a weekday. Uh, we notify the public no less than seven days ahead of time before changing the prices via our, our website uh, and the SF Park websites. And to show what this looks like, um, here's an image of how rates look in the Fisherman's Wharf uh, area um, on the weekdays from noon to 3 o'clock. And the pink shows where we've uh, increased rates. Uh, dark blue is where uh, they decreased. Uh, and the gray is, is where they've stayed the same. Um, and so, you know, you can see, for example, um, right around here we have a space that is $4 an hour, and then immediately around the corner, uh, space is going for uh, 25 cents an hour. Uh, so the idea, again, the goal is to try to uh, shift those uh, uh, parking demand into places where there's uh, actually some spaces available. So what you see here is a, a summary of how we've changed rates at parking meters during the pilot. Uh, starting at the left uh, column uh, is the first rate change uh, that we did. Uh, the gray portion of each band shows the percentage of time we've been hitting our goals for parking availability. And basically what this shows is that uh, we've gradually made it easier uh, to find par a parking space more and more of the time. So the gray is growing. Um, over time, and, and we're kind of hitting our targets in terms of uh, getting that uh, one space per block. And interesting, overall, we've um, actually lowered rates by a total of 34 cents or 12 percent um, uh, in the pilot, uh, based on what it was before. Uh, and then making, by making the payments easier, uh, meter revenues actually increased uh, by about uh, 30 percent. Um, uh, and, you know, with uh, with the, the ease of parking, with the four-hour time limit increase, uh, we've also reduced meter citation significantly, which went down about 30 percent, uh, and garage revenue went up slightly. Um, and you know, in total, it made a little extra revenue. But again, the point isn't about generating the revenue, but really about uh, managing the social and environmental benefits by actually managing uh, our parking, uh, which is the goal of this, pri this project and of, of the pilot program. Uh, some other key features, um, you know, this was a federally funded demonstration project. Uh, so we placed a, a, a big emphasis on evaluation and gathered uh, all the data that we and independent evaluators uh, need uh, to determine how well this approach to managing delivers in terms of being good for drivers and for safety, for transit, and for the environment, for business vitality, and so on. And as you might imagine, this project was uh, uh, producing an avalanche of data, and, and Excel sheets were not cutting it in terms of being able to manage that amount of data. Uh, so we invested in some serious data management and analytical tools, not just to support the, the rigorous evaluation, but to really underpin the operation of the parking system, uh, and then use that to make better decisions about how we're managing our whole transportation system. So we have a, a real treasure trove of data uh, from this. Uh, timeline and next steps. Um, you know, here's an overview of some of the key milestones for the project and some next steps. Uh, the evaluation of this project uh, should be ready this summer. So this was a little bit of a sneak preview of, of some of what we're finding. We'll have uh, a lot more data as we're doing the analysis right now that we'll be able to share uh, this summer. 
And uh, one key piece of that that I did want to share is, is testing a new method for doing demand responsive pricing uh, using data only from the parking meters uh, rather than from the parking sensors. So now we have established a relationship between the sensor data and what we're seeing at the meters. And if we can, and we're finding that it's a pretty uh, stable relationship. Uh, and if we can figure out what that stable relationship is, then uh, we can extrapolate that to other areas without ha having to use uh, the sensors. So that's something that is pretty exciting and something that is replicable and, and something that we hope to share. Um, and, and again, this is critically important because it'll show the way for how cities can, uh, and, you know, at very low cost, uh, use their existing infrastructure to do demand responsive pricing. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's, to learn more about the project, uh, you can go to this website uh, or get the data that we're sharing. Um, we've tried to have the project website be really information rich and, and it's actually uh, really well organized. Uh, there you'll also find a 120 page PDF book uh, that has an uh, incredible amount of information, uh, summarizes a lot of what we've learned so far. Um, and uh, so please do check that out and it was a um, pleasure to share that with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roger. And <clears throat> I think it's Im Im impressive also to see innovation, but it's also great uh, that you started with the message. This is also how we get data and how we can use also the data. So, so congratulations. Um, so next speaker is, is Gareth Bloor. So we're going from the US to just so, so the neighboring city to, uh, to wonderful Cape Town. So Gareth is the uh, counselor in the mayoral committee uh, member and here particular on economics and environmental spatial planning portfolio. So uh, welcome, Gareth. Well, thanks very. Thank you very very much. I suppose, in a sense, some of you may have heard what uh, or got a taste of some of the uh, battles that Cape Town would face, given Johannesburg and the similar legacy that we have in terms of spatial planning and outlay. And that has huge implications for transport because tied to issues of carbon reduction and effective transportation systems are sorts of questions that the citizens are asking around access to resources and economic opportunity. Cape Town essentially has one of, we're one of the highest emitters uh, of any city. You can't just compare it to, uh, you know, looking at global, looking at South Africa, but on global standards too. And of course, we need to reduce that. There is a structural challenge, which is our high reliance on fossil fuels, which is part of the national regulatory framework. And of course, we've got to discuss that issue with the federal government. Uh, but there's also the key uh, problem in terms of emissions. Now, 27% is somewhat lower than the rest of the country. However, we would be disingenuous to say that it was something of a success. We don't have reliance on mining in terms of our economy as some other areas do, but that is around the average. Passenger transport across the city now is heavily skewed in favor of your private vehicles. And aspiration to own a private vehicle is very, very strong. Certainly in Cape Town, it's one of the first things people do when they're able uh, to move into the market and to have access uh, to the opportunity. Many people would buy a home before sooner than they would buy, would buy a car sooner than they buy a home. And of course, you can see business as usual until 2050 is certainly no sustainable way for the city to continue. And so, of course, you had to have an overall strategic plan, and the city's got a city-wide integrated transport plan that was developed around 2006. And I think that is probably consistent with the approach taken by many cities that we've certainly been able to learn from in the way you actually set about uh, reducing the demand for travel as much as you make travel itself sustainable. A key issue here is to promote higher vehicle occupancy rates, and one of the most effective ways so far has been a park and ride facility system. And of course, the issue around safety when you park your car uh, and a low cost, ideally not being charged anything, is certainly a, a very important incentive. And we found that for large employers, engaging with them very closely around effective transport has received huge buy-in from the public. The most critical issue facing businesses in the city was that of saying, reliable transport for our employees is not there, and therefore we've got an economic cost, we've got late employees, people who do not come to work, uh, and the like. And so we've developed supporting policies and tax incentives. That includes a tax incentives policy that is the first in the country which is focused on these sorts of nodes. And we're rolling out the first one in Atlantis, which is an area I'll show you on the map, which is tied to one of the main transport corridors uh, that is developing within the city. 
And then, of course, the issue of marketing is critically important, massive public communications campaigns, uh, and looking at a possible congestion pricing program. And that is certainly one that's very tough to sell. But of course, if you want to take a purely technical analysis, there's suggestions that that would work very, very well. Just some key statistics to give a background of the city. It's a very, very wide and dispersed geography. And so when it comes to spatial planning, you have areas of enormous deprivation and other areas where there's a large concentration of wealth and primarily opportunity where people work and where they reside. And so a key issue has been, how do you start to connect the different forms of transport that exist? Most people at the moment would use rail uh, what we are in negotiation with the national government on is to take the mandate over for controlling that suburban rail system and integrating it very carefully into our rapid bus transport system. Certainly people that I've spoken to out in community meetings and the like are very, very keen and very open to this process. Uh, it hasn't happened as fast, of course, as we would have hoped for, but there certainly is a possibility there. And there is quite a big divide if you look at consumer experiences of rail versus the rapid bus transport system. Many people have very, very good things to say um, about, the, about the bus system and certainly are very keen to see some integration take place. There are the priority corridors that exist across the city. It is a very vast city, and the area around the southeast on that map is where you have your most urgent need to connect people to the mainstream of the city and to economic opportunities. Directly north of that area on the southeast, uh, you do have emerging nodes where we have identified through data massive opportunities to actually increase the amount of economic activity taking place there, and already we've seen some incentives being taken up. And so it's a much shorter journey when you connect some of the economic potential in these nodes with neighboring areas uh, that have a high concentration of people who are obviously looking for job opportunities. The key system characteristics that we have when it comes to this particular system, I think, is to ensure universal access and very, very easy ways of going about uh, fair collection uh, and also pass giving passengers very simple information. Many of these routes, in fact, by definition, all of these routes are brand new. So getting that public education drive has been very, very important. What you will see in terms of urban regeneration has been a massive opportunity to take areas where before you had a, you know, a decay of what were potential public transport nodes, and you've turned that into rapid bus transport lanes. Uh, and that urban revitalization has certainly been very key in integrating sustainability with improving economic growth in those areas that we've identified uh, in, the in the economic data. This is a massive selling point for some communities who previously may have been resistant to public transportation coming directly into their communities where people had cars and were reliant on cars. So there is a massive growth. The latest stats show year on year 46% growth in construction um, and a lot of that coming closer to your transportation nodes, which is very, very exciting for us. So, of course, there's still a lot of work to be done, um, and we're looking at numerous co-benefits at the moment. The key thing is to reduce traveling time. For many residents, that's critical. Until we had this rapid bus transportation system, we had people with traveling time sometimes up to three hours. That's been significantly cut and is far, far more direct. Other aspects that we're able to look at and tap into have been national grant funding provided in the city for successful models. And so a sort of incentive has been set in place to say, when you do have a successful project rollout, there is money to continue that rollout uh, and promote it uh, in a far more coherent way and to, keep, and to keep that happening. I suppose some of the challenges, if one were to come to that, and I see the next presentation about, about to start on that slide, um, is the way that you're effectively able to get your consumers, and this is a profound social issue, so forgive me for steering away from the data, but to get your higher end residents to buy into the notion of public transportation in a way that has happened in several other cities across the world, and at the same time to ensure in your town hall and community meetings that people who are aspiring to a place in the South African economy can recognize that they're not being sold something second best when they're told, well, maybe you, you know, you. We don't, maybe buying a car is not a good idea, taking the bus could be far more sustainable. It's, uh, it's not a message that always sits well. And so to promote public transportation across social classes in, in a vision for the city that is about economic growth, jobs, measurable statistics, rising number of employment opportunities is a very powerful message. And one of the best headlines that we saw uh, was a gentleman who said, I've sold my 
brand new BMW, turns out it was only a year old, and I'm taking the bus. A wonderful way to start to integrate that messaging. And also, Cape Town still got a challenge when it comes to our nodes. A lot of the economy is concentrated in one area, which is almost a corner of the city because we are a peninsula. So we want to facilitate other economic nodes so people are closer to their work opportunities. For many people staying where they are, the prospect of moving is certainly not something that's immediate. There is a land shortage. We're trying to negotiate with national government for more land closer to the city. But getting those economic nodes working is really important. And our first major success was a 3,000 job factory close to the transport hub uh, around Atlantis, where we've offered incentives and we've seen a visit from the, uh, the mayor of China who's looking to come, uh, a mayor of a Chinese city, Jingdao, who's looking to come and actually continue that. Because Cape Town is so well positioned, like many other South African cities, uh, in the supply chain to get your manufacturing happening for the rest of the African market, instead of all those extensive shipping costs, which are also very environmentally concerning uh, between your finished made products in China and your African market. So thank you very, very much for this opportunity, and I do look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Gary, for assisting. That was very impressive, and it was great also to, to hear about the Qingdao story, so bringing also people from China, so oh, this is also what you can learn, this is also the exchange, and uh, so, yeah, very much looking forward to, to the discussion. So the next speaker is uh, Susanna Muhammad, and uh, she comes from the uh, city of, of Bogota, one, one of the, 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 the early leaders also on, on sustainable transport. And um, Bogota, in fact, also won uh, last year also the uh, C40 and CIMIS uh, uh, City Award also for transportation. So it's a, it's a real pleasure also to have uh, Susanna here and to hear the latest from Bogota. Well, thank you for uh, this opportunity. Um, I'm going to speak around what does it mean to manage demand in transport. And if governments uh, should be looking at a demand in transport as something that needs to be filled for the present, or how you smartly create demand and manage demand for the future, depending on what are your key uh, objectives. Sorry. So uh, in, in Bogota, uh, we implemented the bus rapid system in 2000. And uh, we had uh, almost uh, more than one million and a half people every day moving within the bus rapid uh, system. But the system is now, it has created other consequences. And uh, is now like in a, in a place where every new line you create, it costs much, much more than before. So the price between uh, the infrastructure and uh, the cost of the of the technical tariff uh, versus the the what the users can afford is is bringing a very very deep uh, gap. Uh, so we need to create uh, a new mindset for transport and from transport demand that is not only based on the flows of people and how uh, you create corridors according to where people move from and to but you have to rethink the city uh, about what is the type of land use and structures, the economic structures, and how do we create a different type of demand that makes for sustainable transport uh, possible. Because we don't have much more land to continue building uh, bus rapid uh, transit uh, lanes, and also because uh, we are all already at the limits of our geographical uh, area in the city of Bogota. So for Planning the demand for transport, uh, the, key, the key thing now is, is to re rebuild the city uh, from the land use perspective. Um, we said that uh, Bogota is very compacted, and is, as you see in the, in the last two uh, graphics, uh, we almost have uh, higher demands in some of the outskirts areas of the city than the average demand in Mexico City or New York. Uh, but if you see in the downtown, in the center area of the city, the densities are quite low. So one, one first uh, um, thing, uh, to, one first factor to think about is about what, what are the densities, where do people live and where do people work, and what does that mean uh, for sustainable transport? 
Um, a second uh, factor uh, is what is the city you have and what is the city you are uh, striving for. Uh, in the land use plan, we have created what we call the um, the central area of the city is the area where we have a lower densities, like Bogota is a little bit like a plate, like this, where you have empty spaces. This moves alone, sorry. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, empty spa spaces in the center and high densities in the outskirts, so it's like a plate. So we want to turn the plate around and concentrate in the center the population where the economic activity is and leave uh, more space in the outskirts where we uh, come to the ecological structure, to the rivers and, and where actually we have high risk of flooding and, and climate change risk. So this is like the, 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 the model we are moving towards. So if, if you're moving towards a city that looks like this and not how it looks now that is uh, spread towards the outskirts, then you, really need, re start, you need to start rethinking what is then the transport demand and how you're gonna manage or plan your transport system to fulfill this and also to encourage this rather than uh, continue creating the connectivity uh, that uh, increases uh, the, the, the density at the, at the side of the, of the city. This, the third component for planning the demand in transport that we consider is uh, regarding the facilities. How far are people from the facilities? And um, Bogota is a very social segregated city where uh, the people that have uh, less income and capacity have less access to facilities, and they are the ones, of course, that need them to travel longer and uh, in a more congested uh, situation to get access to the services. So the land use plan starts creating a system where people can be very close to different facilities and where you locate your schools, your hospitals, health services, public services, start also uh, creating other type of conditions for the demand of transport, uh, rather than everybody trying to travel to services uh, far away, which also brings a, a big issue on social segregation. The poorer the people are, the larger distance they have to travel, the less time they have to produce, the, the, the deeper they go into the poverty trap. So this is the, the third um, aspect. It's, this, this shows um, what we, we see. Bogota has a, a system for uh, uh, subsidies of public system that is called strata. Uh, the, the one strata are the poorest people, stratum six are the, the people with more wealth. And as you see, the commuting times uh, for the people that are, are wealthier are, are less than for the other uh, people. And then you come to the fifth factor to plan your transport demand, uh, which is about the modes of transportation. How does people move in the city? What type of means do they use? And it's very surprising, we do this through a survey, every two year survey, it's called the mobility survey. It's a very in-depth survey that uh, maps how people move, where do they move from and to, for what reasons, at what times. Um, it, it, it has a, a very big collection of data. And one of the key learnings of the last survey is that um, more than 25% of the people use walking for the trips that are longer than 15 minutes. So we, we map uh, trips that are longer than 15 minutes and that are for one purpose, or they're not casual walks, but actually you walk with a purpose, you have to go from one place to the other. Uh, how many people walk and why do they walk? And what we found out is that uh, the majority of the poorest people have to walk 15 minutes or longer, even to an hour, uh, because they don't have uh, enough money to pay for the transport system. So even if we have developed a very modern transport system, we have the bus uh, rapid transit system since 2000, um, there is still a big portion of the population that cannot economically access to it. And the way they move in the city is by walking. And the, the second way is by bicycling. So, so people cycle one hour, one hour and a half. Uh, so, and the third factor, which is interesting, the so, another social factor we found was that the people that walk the more are children going to school and old people uh, that, that they don't have also the conditions. So these are the type of population that cannot access uh, the transport system. And is the, is the next factor you have to take into account about how you manage your demand for transport and, and the transport policies. Um, and the next one, um, 
besides the modes of transport, where people use the traditional transport system more than the new transmillennial system, plus you have a big portion of the people moving by bicycle and, and walking, you have an increase uh, in cars that have doubled in the last uh, 10 years. So around 2002, Bogota had something like uh, 500,000, 550,000 uh, cars, and now we have like a million 400,000. And motorcycles, uh, we used to have uh, 10 years ago something like 30,000 bicy motor bicycles. We have now 350,000 bi uh, motor bicycles. So the demand uh, for the use of public, uh, of, of private car, has made the mobility in the city to collapse. Um, and these this basically are like the factors uh, we have taken into consideration uh, for the next. Uh, uh, set of measures that we have taken. Let's see. Oh. Sorry. Okay, so this is like the, the current situation. So on the one hand, we have um, a system that is now in the verge, I will call it, of, of collapse. Many cars uh, using the, the space for roads, no land capacity to build new roads, like no space to build new roads, a big portion of the population that is not able to access the public uh, transport system, and a, a huge increase in private car usage. Uh, so as a city right now, we have decreased our capacity to, uh, uh, the speeds of moving in the city from around 30 kilometers per hour uh, like 10 years ago to only 23 kilometers per hour right now, which all the social economic implications. So what we are moving towards to be able uh, to uh, shift from uh, a demand management that is only based on flows uh, of people from and to work, uh, we, we have to shift uh, to the creation of a smarter city. city. And uh, for that, uh, there are the, the, the next, the, the following are the key measures that uh, the government is taking. First, we have created subsidies uh, for the transport uh, system to be able to bring the demand from the people that only has access to walk on bicycle to the public uh, transport. Uh, second, uh, and, and subsidies have been like a big political debate because in Bogota there's been this paradigm that this, the transport system has to be self-sustaining just for, from tariffs. But that part of them has bring these social segregation issues. So the government is entering to subsidize with a big, big, big uh, political uh, debate. Second, the money, the public money that we are investing in infrastructure has the, se the following order of priority. First, we're going to invest, we are investing in uh, uh, people, the infrastructure for people to walk due to the high uh, demand of, of pedestrians. Second, on the integration of bicycle lines uh, to the public transport system. Third, into the public transport uh, base on the integrated transport system. We are modernizing all the fleet, bringing it to low carbon uh, uh, fleets uh, as, a, as a way uh, to increase equality uh, of the quality of transport. And in last place, uh, we, we leave the private car. Uh, we are uh, making all the studies to imp implement congestion charge, and from February this year onwards, uh, we are implementing this system where uh, cars can only um, circulate in certain areas of the city on certain schedules, and uh, to get into the center of the city, your car can only get inside uh, two or three days a week if they have at least three passengers uh, in a way to, uh, to increase the use of car. Uh, we used to put schedules on cars, but what happened is that people started buying two or three cars. So that's why we have this increase in car, uh, in car, uh, um, it's, it's amazing. Like I, I know people that have six cars because they want to use one per every day uh, to avoid the prohibition uh, to circulate in a certain days. Um, I'll show you just like la last two slides. Um, and uh, these are the, we have 10 projects called uh, the Safe Environmental Pedestrian Networks, uh, which are taking complete zones and uh, make them uh, priority for pedestrian circulation. They are connected between 
key demand uh, hubs for transport and the main public uh, transport hubs in a way that, that people can recover their ownership of the street and that they can circulate by walking or bicycle to the transport hubs trying to leave uh, the car uh, uh, besides. Um, so in conclusion, uh, to be able to manage demand it's not only important to think about the current flows and how you build infrastructure to connect people from one place to the other, but to really question what, is, what are the key uh, land uh, use aspects, what are the key social uh, inclusion needs for the transport system, and uh, also how do we prioritize the human being at the center of the transport system rather than making uh, people uh, the object of the transport system, which is like what we sort of do now. That's it. <laughs> thank, thank you, thank you, Susanne. Just, just a word, word of cautious with the, the higher occupancy vehicles. There's one store in Jakarta, <coughs> in Jakarta, in fact, is a creator complete new jobs. Because uh, you have now people actually outside the zone um, hanging around, and then also um, get some some money to get in the car. So so that's that's also sometimes also some of the of the of the side effects. So uh, uh, a word of warning. So but it's great. So last speaker we have um, going to wonderful Italy. We have uh, Pier Francesco Maran. He's the uh, commissioner for environment in the city of Milan, and uh, uh, looking forward to hear more from Pier Francesco. Francesco on their activities. Thanks. Thank you. Also, can we go? Okay. Hold on. Uh, well, we'll talk about especially the sustainable urban mobility plan uh, of Milan. Uh, we are writing it uh, in this month, but uh, we are uh, creating the first initiatives. Uh, till uh, we start uh, to administrate Milan uh, two years ago. These are the 10 uh, main uh, axes uh, of action uh, of the plan. And uh, in uh, those uh, two years, uh, Milan for uh, uh, the TomTom uh, -tom Europe Index uh, moved from the 10th most congestion city in Europe to the 24th. So uh, we had uh, a big reduction of the congestion of the traffic of the city even because of the first action of the, the plan. Uh, well, this is uh, some general information on Milan. Milan is uh, 1.3 million uh, of people. It's the second uh, largest city of Italy, but is, uh, it's the center uh, for the economical uh, actions uh, in, uh, in Italy. It's uh, well known as a fashion and design uh, capital. Uh, of course, uh, there is uh, a large use uh, of a car, these are uh, uh, the way people move. We have, uh, of course, a problem inside the city, but we especially have a problem of uh, coming and going from uh, the outside of the city. We are also having uh, um, uh, institutional um, change from the city to the metropolitan area. And in the last eight years, as you can see, the, mob the model split uh, produce the changement from cars to public transport, especially. Uh, even because we increased the, the, the subway lines, but also because of change of behavior of citizens. And luckily, as you can see, we have still to work hard on cyclists. Uh, we still have the same number of cyclists, and we don't have the result that we expected at the moment. The first action we introduced to reduce the congestion of the city is a congestion charge. Uh, we had uh, the red area in the center of the city that is the most important area of Milan because uh, uh, just a few part of citizens live there, 80,000 uh, on 1.3 million, but uh, 600,000 people enter every day in that area of the city especially using public transport, but partially using cars. And uh, we thought that uh, breaking this way to enter the city, the, to enter the center, we would have reduced the number of people entering the city uh, at all. And uh, this is what happened. We had uh, um, an area of cameras uh, to control, uh, and we introduced some simple rule. 
every cars entering in the, the working time, that is from 7.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m., with an exception on Thursday that is till 6 p.m., will pay five euros. Every car, but uh, the um, less pollutant car, electric, hybrid, LPG, they will not pay. And the, the most pollutant car are forbidden to enter, apart, of course, of some exception for uh, some categories. Uh, so it's a, a simple way that uh, produced uh, some result, especially the reduction of traffic of 28% in uh, uh, the center from one day to the next. Of course, at the beginning, the first week, uh, it was more than 35 because uh, you have to get familiar with uh, uh, new rules, but now it's, a f it's the second year of congestion charge and it's stable on 28%. It increased uh, the traffic speed for bus, bus and tram lines of the city. Uh, we can do more on it, but uh, it's uh, a first uh, uh, result, there was a reduction of uh, uh, cars accidents and uh, a reduction of uh, parking occupation. As uh, we can see later, it was very interesting what's happening in San Francisco, uh, this is uh, one of the main problems of the, the city at the, the moment. Uh, sorry, can't, uh, um, of course, we have some results even in uh, pollution. It's hard to show it because um, uh, especially PM10 is a regional indicator and it's hard to see the results on a so small area, but we can measure the reduction of emission that are uh, uh, the result. Uh, and uh, we studied uh, especially the black carbon that is uh, really interesting because um, it's uh, a more local um, emission uh, um, uh, uh, part and uh, we saw that uh, there is uh, a large difference between uh, what's happening inside the congestion charge area and outside of the congestion uh, charge area. We also saw the difference between uh, the congestion charge area and the pedestrian area that are, of course, uh, uh, better. But uh, we decided to measure the result of congestion charge, especially in the reduction of traffic, because uh, the pollutant uh, uh, results can be uh, easily contested by the PM10 and uh, can uh, reduce uh, the effect and uh, the positive uh, result, even in public opinion, uh, of the congestion charge. What uh, we do with uh, the incomes of the congestion charge? It's the second year. In the, the first year, the income of the congestion charge was uh, 20 million of euros. Of course, uh, there is uh, another important income that is uh, the fines of people that forget to pay or decide not to pay. Uh, by this money, we uh, increased uh, the frequency of public transport uh, the same day uh, we started the congestion charge, uh, metro line especially, but also some bus line entering the center. And uh, we financed the, the second part of the bike sharing program. As you can see, the bike sharing program was just in the center of the city. Now we cover uh, half of the city and we are working on an e-bike system uh, to go to, the, um, uh, to, to all the rest of the city in 2015, 2016. Uh, the last year, uh, we arrived at 29 million of income, but uh, we are uh, now having a different way to calculate uh, the balance of mobility, even because, uh, as uh, we can see later, uh, we are working on the um, public transport infrastructure program. We uh, opened a new subway line, the number five. We opened first the number five, then we will open the number four. Um, and uh, um, as every new lines, uh, we have the problem that uh, the uh, cost of the service and the cost of the investment is larger, uh, more expensive than the income. So we are using a congestion charge as part of the strategy uh, to pay the new subway line. Milan is building uh, two new uh, infrastructure, line five that will be ready in 2015, and line four that uh, opened uh, uh, just uh, some months ago, we started to build it. Uh, we are also enlarging uh, the line number one, that is the most important uh, line of the city, and is going to the city of Monza, that is uh, uh, 10 kilometers far from uh, Milan. Now we are moving uh, our goals from uh, the idea of uh, redu reducing the congestion of the traffic, we are no more in, at the end uh, 
of the uh, of uh, of the list because we are not more of the tenth most congestion city in Europe, but we are on the alpha. Uh, but we have still the problem of the number of cars for inhabitants. In Milan, we have 55 cars for inhabitants. Ten years ago, there were 65 cars. But uh, this is the main problem of uh, um, the streets of Milan because uh, uh, then you have parking problem. Then you have problem. Most of the congestion problem are because uh, people don't park correctly, and. Uh, Citizens of Milan use cars just a little, just the 3% of the time. The rest of the time, they are parked. So we want to convince them to uh, own less car and to use car when they need. Car sharing is a great opportunity. Uh, last uh, uh, summer, on June, we opened the market of car sharing to private operators. On June, we had 130 public cars of car sharing. Now we are moving to 1,500 with uh, new operators, especially Car2Go that was the first, but after that they opened two new operators that are uh, Italian companies, uh, one from Fiat, that is the, the red one, and uh, now, uh, another company that is, uh, will start in the next month uh, the, with the Volkswagen cars. We think that is a part of strategy, not just uh, to convince people using car less because uh, they, uh, we oblige them with some uh, um, uh, with the, the congestion charge, but also because we give them some opportunity to move uh, saving money. Car sharing can be a great solution, even because Italian people is, uh, uh, love to use cars uh, that much. We are also moving uh, on the idea on pedestrian and cyclist uh, people. As you can see, as we saw before, we still have uh, lots of things to do. First is uh, uh, to ask people to respect other people. So 30 kilometers area, we think, uh, can be a solution to convince people to respect the other. It's a way you can go by car, of course, but you have to respect the pedestrian and, see, and, uh, and uh, cyclist. Uh, we started from the center. Uh, we have a program in every area of the city in order to use it, them as a, a way to show that uh, you can go by car even uh, slower and that nothing happen on it. Uh, it's uh, at the beginning, Italians are not used to it uh, as other uh, European countries, but uh, we believe it could be a good uh, uh, solution. Last uh, of all, in 2015, uh, Milan will all host a World Exposition 2015. Uh, everybody uh, of you is uh, welcome to visit Milan that year. And of course, uh, for us, uh, it gets a great challenge because in six months, uh, we will have 20 million of uh, visitors. This is a, a great challenge for public transport, but we think we can use this experience to offer a new idea of mobility to people coming to Milan, but even to have a new solution for the citizens of, of Milan for the future. Thank you. They put us very close to, together here, so that's very, very cozy. So uh, thanks, to, 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 thanks to all of you for, for really inspiring presentations, and uh, I think it was very exciting. So what, did, what excites you most when you heard about the, the, the different examples? What is it also what inspires San Francisco saying, oh, this sounds interesting, or this is already what we currently have in our pipeline or doing? What, what, what inspires you here? Uh, I mean, I think from, from Bogota, really thinking about social justice and uh, looking at communities that are lower income and how we uh, integrate them into our transportation planning. And we, we've uh, done some thinking about that as well. But um, uh, it's good to see that in a city like Bogota. We have, for example, um, free uh, Muni, which is our, our bus system, uh, free passes for low-income youth as a way to uh, help low-income youth uh, get to school, get to work, uh, get to important things that they need to get to. Um, and certainly, you know, congestion charge is something that we've been thinking about in San Francisco uh, for a little bit, uh, particularly down in our uh, central business corridor. Um, and uh, it's great to see the data from Milan uh, in, in the actual reductions that they've seen, both in terms of 
of, of traffic, but also air quality improvements as a result of that. And um, I think just to have that kind of, of those kinds of results documented is, is really, really fantastic. So I think those are just a, a couple of things that came to mind. Thanks. Uh, so you were talking about congestion charging, and I noticed Garris, in fact, brought that up, saying, oh, this might be also something for, 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 for Cape Town. So uh, what inspired you, Garris? <laughs> Well, I think certainly a sense almost of solidarity with Bogota, understanding the spatial challenges, and I've been lucky to visit the city. But I think what I found inspiring about San Francisco is the fact that cities can and have gotten to the point where you can focus on very particular projects like the one you were doing around parking, which, which make perfect sense, which are accessible through technology with using the iPhone, but also to see in Milan the very tangible behavioral changes that seem to be coming about, because there obviously is resistance a lot of the time. And I think when it comes to a leadership angle in understanding the various challenges or hindrances uh, and the expectations of residents is to actually phase in the way you approach things. And I think to clearly demonstrate benefits tangibly ahead of what may be some tough decisions. And I think that phase in approach um, can often be quite useful and relaying to models that work in other cities certainly does actually have some resonance uh, with people when you seek to provide examples, particularly in other emerging markets, if you're looking at Cape Town's context. Pierre Francesco, we, we, we heard lots of people now looking into Milan on, on congestion charging, and we know this is one of, of the challenges where we probably, with BRT, we reached a tipping point, this is accepted now, but uh, congestion charging, we have, have some examples. So tell us a little bit about the success story of Milan. What, what made it also, how, how did you get through? How did you also tackle the issues? Well, we, uh, we had a pollution charge until 2008, but um, uh, three years ago it was clear that the results of the pollution charge, especially if you don't uh, uh, change the rules year by year, uh, will be uh, uh, few and uh, uh, poor convincing for people. And uh, it's hard to change the rules every year because uh, you have to be political strong to do it, uh, especially when there are elections, etc. Congestion charge surely um, works better because uh, even if uh, richer people change cars, uh, they will go on uh, paying and uh, you ask people not to, to change car, but to, to change behavior, to use uh, a bit less car, if they can, of course, and to use a little more uh, public transport. So at the moment, uh, I think uh, uh, it is an alternative of complementary to the parking management system, like uh, the one we saw in San Francisco. But uh, if uh, uh, people, citizens, uh, don't have still uh, the technology for uh, so uh, even a complicated system like the one of uh, San Francisco, uh, maybe it's uh, uh, the um, uh, easier solution to obtain a results uh, in some months. You just have to put on cameras. There are some secrets uh, for the result. For example, uh, when we introduced the congestion charge on January 2012, for the two, uh, first two months, uh, you can't, uh, you can uh, pay after two months. Now you have to pay every 20, uh, 24 hours later. But uh, we move uh, uh, the, the chance to see the result. The, the streets were emptier. And uh, uh, we uh, uh, get far the, the fact that you have to pay. That was uh, quite important because at the beginning it was not so popular. But now it's uh, uh, really accepted by citizens. Mm -hmm. Then me too, I'm fascinated by the fact that Bogota uh, not just talk about mobility, but about the right of mobility. That oh. is one of our tasks. Oh, right. So talking about Bogota, so, um, and you mentioned uh, <coughs> congestion charging as well. So what, what, is, what is your take? What, what, what can you bring us back, back to the mayor so from, from Milan, but also from other cities? Now, it is in, in the plan of the current government to implement congestion charge. They've been doing the studies, uh, visiting some cities like London and, and Milan. Uh, but we will going to have a very difficult political debate because it needs to be approved by the council. Um, and we don't have majority. And uh, they, they're going to block it. Uh, so the question is uh, how you get uh, some uh, governing strategies to be able to bring even the measure uh, to life uh, because of the strong opposition. Uh, as, you, as you saw, the increase in cars is uh, unmanageable. Um, as uh, Cape Town uh, referred, it's a uh, social aspiration. 
Um, and uh, but the positive thing, at least in Bogota now, that is that the the traffic is so unbearable that uh, that I think uh, people are now willing to do anything to be able to move in a better way. Now we we are we reached that point that uh, congestion is just uh, unmanageable. Mm. So let's see how the political debate goes. Everybody is, is nodding. So, what, what comes comes next now in, in in Cape Town, and where you see her so that really are so tackling this unbearable situation? Well, I think the key thing that comes next is uh, to see the results of the economic development that is happening now along these transport corridors, which have been a key part of the BRT system, because that's going to start to change the spatial makeup of the city and by definition remute, reduce commute times because people are closer to their source of work as opposed to taking an hour and a half long trip one way in a given day to work. So I think that's the first thing. I think the second is going to be the integration, and this is going to be part of our national government dialogue with the suburban rail service, because what we've been really impressed by as public representatives is the uptake in the BRT system when it's made available. And I suppose the lesson for, for those of us who think, oh, why can't people just be more enlightened to take that sort of view? It's a dangerous view because when given the option, people do take it up and have been very willing. So I think the key lesson is to continue to see the commitments we've made in terms of a spatial planning elements and economic development, see those through to completion, attract those investments in the nodes that are close to these areas. So of course we do have transportation uh, and an effective BRT system, but we also reduce commute times at the same time and take off pressure uh, in one particular part of the city uh, or two particular economic nodes to spread that economic opportunity because there's a kind of modernist philosophy to Cape Town spatial planning and that is you live in one place, you work in another, you have leisure in another and all of these areas are very, very far apart um, and obviously added to that project is that that previous project was a, was a strong racial element that completely undermined social justice for the majority of residents to access those opportunities uh, that developed in one area but were not allowed to develop in others. Susanna, you, you, you highlighted briefly also in your presentation the importance to change the, the spatial paradigm also in, 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 in Bogota, and you showed also some pictures about also densification, and we heard also from Cape Town, this is also part also of, of their strategy. Tell us a, a, a little bit more, where are you with, with these plans and, and how you want to, to, to implement that? Uh, it, it is an in integral strategy where you government uh, comes and starts creating uh, development opportunities in areas of the city where traditionally developers and the real estate market will not come uh, to develop, especially the central areas, because uh, the price of land is uh, higher uh, in those safer central areas. So to have social housing there becomes very expensive. And the problem is that then you build the social housing, which is the majority of the population, to the outskirts, and you then are creating a, a transport disaster because every day people need to move from the outskirts to the central city to be able to work. So what the government is doing is um, opening, like controlling the real estate market and opening uh, responsibility for every project they build. They have to give 30% land uh, in to public housing, uh, either in land or either in money. Um, and the, the thinking around that is that then if we are able to start moving the people that are in the outskirts to the central cities, they will be able to have more access uh, to work amenities and the paradigm, like the, the land use plan, is that everybody is at uh, by, by far away 20 minutes from the working opportunities. Um, so that changes then the planning of mobility. Rather than uh, still creating this really uh, long, rapid bus transit um, uh, roads, uh, which take a lot of space. We, we, you were talking about with Milan that uh, you're, you're having an issue of being in the system because of space. And we don't have space in, in Bogota anymore. Um, then you reduce the, the time for people to move. But this has created a very strong opposition in the real estate market, of course, and a very high political debate. And uh, we are about to be taken out of government because of that. So. Uh, this, this is the, the, the type of, um, of thinking. So the transport is being prioritized, the planning, the stations, how people move around those priority areas where the city wants uh, to develop uh, ne next. Okay. 
saying so time is 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 passing passing by and i got also the message also from the organizer we have to 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 stop on on time so to each of you so really um 20 20 seconds what, what do we see also when we have also in two years time uh, the forum again of c40 what what will we see also new things uh, from from each of of, of your city I, uh, in, uh, in the next two years. Huh? Yeah. What will you impress us in two years from now? <laughs> well, hope, um, uh, we, uh, hope we move uh, from the idea that um, we are trying to limit uh, the use of cars, that is uh, what all the cities uh, are doing, uh, to the um, goal to create uh, new opportunities of mobility. That is, I think, uh, uh, especially for mobility experts, a uh, 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 need uh, to, to think different uh, because uh, uh, we, we had, especially in, our, in my city, but not only in my city, uh, had to create great uh, policies to reduce immediately uh, something, but now we have to create alternatives. And this is, I think, uh, the way we can involve citizens in a change. Okay. So providing access for all. Okay. Yeah, for us, uh, the main challenge is uh, this year actually to take out all the old buses in Bogota and uh, replace it with the integrated transport system and a new fleet. It's going to be a fleet of around 12,000 buses, um, and we're going to reduce the fleet, current fleet, which we have buses of 20 years, really polluting buses, uh, from 18,000 to 12,000 uh, this year with uh, new buses, and also the integration of public bicycles. Uh, stations of Transmilenio and the cycling roads uh, to be able to really make an integrated experience between the pedestrian, the bicycle, and the public transport that hopefully will make people uh, think twice before taking their car because it will be in time and efficiency more efficient to walk, take your bicycle, leave it in the station, take the Transmilenio or take the, the zonal bus, uh, bus to be able to get around. What do we see in San Francisco? Well, we're going to have some incredible data and information to share this summer. Uh, and I think, you know, in a couple of years, we'll be able to share where we've taken SF Park in terms of the rest of the city. Um, in addition, we just launched Bike Share finally in San Francisco this past year. So I'm interested to see how that grows across the city. And finally, there's this question of how do we fund uh, transit infrastructure uh, in a sustainable way, and we just, uh, the mayor convened a task force to look at that issue and found that our transit system has been underfunded to the tune of about $10 billion by 2030. So this November, we have a, a $500 million bond measure going to the voters uh, to help fund uh, uh, transit projects across the city, including roads and getting new buses and, and all that. So that's going to be a big, big campaign. Thank you. Well, in two years, the goal will to be still stay in office and try to get these measures through <laughs> adequately. Number one is would be to to complete the rollout of our bus rapid transport system, therefore reaching every aspect of a city that's still very spatially divided. The second would be to have concluded or come close to concluding the integration of rail with our bus rapid transport system so that there is increased mobility to every part of the city. And then finally, we've identified through data, and we're going to work with C40 on this further, 71 potential economic nodes across the city that can help move to a more mixed-use a uh, situation where people don't have to have this demand for travel um, because they do work closer or significantly their travel demand times come down. And I think that's going to be something that needs to happen along with our incentives policy, which is directly targeted. So we want to maintain that growth rate in the construction set, uh, sector, but obviously focus on it having a green buildings component and happening along these rail corridors so we can see more headlines like, you know, 50 apartments snapped up by a single investor because of the prospect of having public transportation close by. Thanks. These, these examples and uh, they, the prospects are great. So we're really looking forward in two years or so to hold you accountable, seeing okay, you really make 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 progress. So uh, let me share just just uh, two observation at 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 the end. Um, I think there are, there are many or so common elements here which we uh, saw, but um, two to highlight. One is is that the the, the 
um, main theme of the conference is on, on data and measurement. And by seeing also all the presentation, every single city makes now so the argument on data. It's it's data driven. It's a it's a good solid analysis. But also going beyond that, using that really as managing demand, but also using that better also to communicate and giving us a better argument. So I think also the report really shows how how much data is now there, and that also is is one one of the, the, the one of the components uh, another component you just uh, had the, the had the time also to talk about some specific activities but also you showed uh, from Milan um, to Bogota to San Francisco to to Cape Town this is really about the integration of activities it's not just about one single activities it's a bringing together the land use with, with, with the transportation, bringing together a comprehensive sustainable mobility plan. And that's also where I see a trend also around the world saying we really also need to, to bring also this, these pieces all, all together to really uh, improve also the accessibility for, for, for all cities. So with that, I also would like to thank uh, uh, you for, for joining our session. Um, all the speakers, so please uh, join me in a warm applause. So, um, and finally, I hope also during, during also the, the next coffee break, also um, reach out to our speakers, but also reach out also to uh, the partners from C40. Uh, Gunjan is also over there, and uh, if you have any question there, and there's a great, will be great knowledge platformers on C40, which I um, should have raised, so, so I've done my duty with that. So thanks again for everybody. Thank you.